Um, there are about three dozen known iridescent viruses, and they name them by order of discovery. So the one of mosquitoes, which is of great interest for a possible biopesticide or control agent, is iridescent three. And the one that wax moth is iridescent six. Wax moth and other moths, and so on. Uh, and the one in the bee in Asia is iridescent 24. Uh, again, covert infections, lethal, infect lethal when they express themselves in the host of carriers, they kill in two ways. Most viruses kill by reproducing themselves in your cells and organs. This one doesn't have to do much reproducing to kill. It produces a toxic protein. Sean Bellamoria has actually synthesized that protein, has a patent on it, because he was trying to get the virus to be a control agent for mosquitoes, but he couldn't really reliably turn on and off the virus. So he took the other approach and synthesized the toxic protein that it produces, and there may be a new biopesticide coming down the pike. At least that's part of his circumstance here is to see if he can uh, use that. So this thing kills in two ways. And then again, that's not good news for beekeepers. Okay, at very high titers, they produce the iridescent color. And what happens is, is that because of that shape, when you pack them together, they literally line themselves up in rows or arrays. And when the light goes through them, it bends the light and produces color, just like the surface of a CD that I use in this computer bends light to produce color. Oh, the rainbow you see in the sky, or the blue you see in the sky. And so These are not pigment colors, they're called structural colors. And it's bending and interfering with the light movement. Pillbuck or roly poly. Myth has it that a blue roly poly is good luck, like finding a shamrock. Not good luck for the roly poly. <laughs> One of my associates down at the national meeting says, Oh, she really liked the blue color. I forgot to tell you that you don't want to see this. If you see this, I want you on the phone to call me immediately, tell me you've got it, and get me samples of freezing because it's rare that we see the colors manifested in the bees. We have heard about it, but we have not seen it much. That's probably because either the bees that have the colors are, already, are the ones that went out the door, or it's killing them by the tote protein it's producing. It didn't get to the concentration to produce the colors. We're really, this is a critical key of samples that are actually showing. Yes, sir? Is that being irradiated by a regular sunlight? Yep. Uh, now, in wax moths that are brown by nature, when we get it building up on it, because we can inoculate the wax moth and reproduce the virus, uh, they'll actually turn really blue-white, like a cool fluorescent ball, but they won't turn this, you won't see this bright blue on them. So, take a look at these pupa. They got that kind of blue-white look to them and so on. This is critical. Look for these. If you see it, you've got part of the puzzle. And I really want to know the samples. And for all the folks that uh, our detractors say it doesn't exist in bees, well, you know, take a look at that. So, I'd be remiss if I didn't give you some recommendations. We don't know everything about it. We haven't had the funding to really explore it to the way it deserves. There's no discretionary pot of money for emergency findings that might fix this thing. You know, the wheels of this type of thing in the granting world are slow. Um, but I can tell you something. Good nutrition. Anecdotally, beekeepers who have problems with this generally had a bad summer the year before. Yeah, and so on. Um, certainly both of them are in the gut. So if you've already got a compromised system and so on, and you're you're scanned on nutrition and so on, having two pathogens going to town in your gut, you know. I'm guessing here, but I imagine if you could interview a bee that's got this problem, they'd probably say this is like having stomach flu and food poisoning all at the same time. And so on. Um, I wish I could tell you which of the supplements and stuff might help, but uh, I can say is, you know, palm subs and so on, if you're low on palm. If you see your bees stall out in the summer and they look like they should be growing, but they're just not growing and they're not making honey, you probably got this problem and you're probably going to see them collapse in the fall. If they go off and feed, you can't really get them to take any treatment, so you want to intercede as fast as possible to try to get the problem fixed. You can't do anything at the moment that we know of about the virus, but you can do some things about the nosema. And so monitor your sema, and if you see it building up, start treating. And I understand you don't have a lot of options, but uh, take whatever. 
Or in our part of the world, a lot of these guys are overwintering in sheds. And last year we saw the first real collapses in the sheds. And think of a shed. High humidity, stay, you know, everybody can find, all sharing the same air and so on. A prescription for if you want this thing to run amok and so on is uh, that. So if you're in sheds, watch the humidity. You know, you can't have it too, you don't want it too dry, but don't let it get too damn wet and soggy. And as you get bees dying, get them out of there. One of the things we see with guys that split is the guys going to migration for pollination love to split their colonies before they put them on the trucks so they don't have to work out the other end. Take a strong colony, split it into two or three big boxes, not nuke boxes, throw it on a truck, transport it across the country, and throw it out in a, in a lowland area of California where for the next two months they have very little food and it's likely to have brown fog and um, cool, wet weather and you're setting yourself up for a high-risk scenario from what we've seen. Now, I'm, I'm stretching here. I'm basically giving you my opinion on these things now because we don't, we don't have the hard evidence from the virus we have, but we know these two pathogens in general from the life cycle and stuff, and they thrive in cool wet. Monitor and control your nosema. We think you got a two, you got a double whammy here, and you can do something about your nosema. So try to keep your nosema levels down if it starts to take off. Now I'm not an advocate of just straight out treating for treatments per se, but you can take a microscope. Any high school kid can essentially look at these things. If you can't find another way of doing it and so on, and you can see the nosema. So dissectomy, look for the nosema. And if you start seeing nosema levels building up and so on, probably the time to intercede. Well, we are trying to find funding for this. We need to isolate, extract, and get the real thing, sequence it, and then inoculate with it to really put the last nail in the coffin on this. So I can't say I found the cause. I can tell you we're about 80 to 95 percent sure we found the cause, but I can't tell you I've got the cause until we can go these final steps. Uh, once we get to that point, though, maybe we can find a quick and dirty test for it. Rob Kramer is looking at PCR. He had not had a lot of success there, but if you use something called an antibody test, it looks like that may work. And if you can do that, then we can let you monitor the virus. And that's probably the real thing you want a virus and so on. But again, we can't do that until we can isolate the thing and sequence it. So it's, I'm very frustrated <laughs> because I can't find any money for that. <laughs> 48,000 people read this, but uh, none of our agencies think this is of enough interest to fund. Uh, now, there are folks, there's detractors that say that there's a paper out there that says, oh, you didn't know what you're doing, uh, you miscalculated, and you identified B peptides and proteins that are, and called them the iridescent. There are 18,900 peptides associated with this virus. We only counted them, and when people ask me for the data set, we only send them the data set we put in the paper, which are several, somewhere around 140 to 150 peptides associated with this virus that were well in excess of 95% confidence. We had lots more, but we just didn't send them. You know, what's the chance of error that we're wrong? Well, we had 140 or so. Uh, I have to reread this thing myself, but it's uh, we had a goodly number. You know, if we had, we're not basing this on one or two peptides. We're basing it on a goodly number. All of our samples were bees. So, interesting enough, our detractors believe that we found all the RNA viruses. They believe that we found Kogugo and Varroa destructive virus 1, which are RNA viruses that had not been reported in the United States before, but they don't believe the DNA virus. Now, this is an instrument. The instrument's dumb. It's not biased, you know. So if the instrument found these things, you believe those, then why don't you believe the other one the instrument found? I don't quite follow that logic, okay? Uh, we did include all the B peptides and stuff in. We just didn't bother to send them all along. You want to read through another several thousand lines of uh, peptides and so on? They weren't germane, you know. We, the data program that the Army has, sorted through it. Said all these are plant viruses. There's about 500 of those. All these are B peptides and so on. We only stepped forward when people asked the viruses from the pathogen. It wasn't that we didn't see them. We just didn't basically, you know, we sent them the data that we analyzed with this particular paper. So yes, we saw all those B peptides and proteins and so on, but we also saw all the rest of them and so on. So it's not like we didn't see them. And they were all B samples. So tell me, if the Army cannot tell the difference between a virus peptide and a B peptide, then why did all those collapsing samples stand out statistically at highly significant difference from all of the other samples. 
I mean, they all should have looked the same. There's something definitely different in those samples. So, um, now, the other labs don't have the advanced technology that the Army does because they have developed their own multi-database screening filtering systems and so on. Um, the Army right now is working hard to get that license to made available to people that run the instruments that do proteomics and so on because they basically have a better tool. And so if you don't have that tool, you may not have quite the power in sorting through these types of things. There's also something called a round robin. You get a bunch of labs, you send the same known samples to everybody, but all the labs are blind, and then they all report back. And in the last couple of months, the Army's been engaged in several round robins uh, organized by uh, FDA, CDC, and so on. And typically, the Army sees everything in the sample, and the other labs miss some things and so on. So I'm confident that the Army knows what it's doing when it does these analyses. And they are working on a rebuttal for the paper that says we don't know the difference between them. So, so you know, why do some of the other find? Most of them are using gene-based approaches. We have an unsequenced uh, virus. If you don't have the exact sequence, the gene probe will not see it. Our own people don't see it using the gene-based approaches, but they see it using the antibody approaches. And you just saw the photographs of it and so on. So it's there. Um, so, the Army has been doing well, um, and these last couple of things, is, if, if there's any proteomics folks in the other thing and so on, we're not just using spectral counting, we are using the protein identification. Uh, we're very rigorous in what we call detection. We, we throw out a lot of stuff that doesn't meet our standards, um, and, you know, true and false recovery rates, but of no great consequence to most of us here. But anyway, that's our story. So I hope that helps you. Yes, sir. Yeah, so can we rule out uh, the pesticide imidacloprid? All right, pesticides. Since these things are all probably susceptible to stress, pesticides may be a stressor. They can act as a trigger. You want my personal opinion? I have found, having seen two massive waves of it, if I visit a bee yard that's in a low spot, like a reservoir or, or a creek bottom, and it's got a fog bank hanging over and it's wet, that's where they're going to be. And so on. So one of the things is say, try to stay out of those wet, damp areas, stay dry. Pesticides, all these stress factors could certainly enter in. I distinguish pesticide kills, per se, that generally end up with dead bees, and so on. They certainly occur. And uh, uh, my problem is that I think people confuse CCD with pesticide kills, and so on. Now, pesticide could certainly enter in the equation. We had very limited funding. People criticize us for not looking at pesticides. We didn't have any money to look at pesticides. Others did, and so on. So um, um, I'm not ruling pesticides out of maybe being a stress factor in some, but personally, I believe this is a contagious thing, having seen it flow through. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, so we're used to saying that the only time we see CCD is, uh, is uh, early into the winter, and but are we actually seeing it? We're blaming it on swarms. It could be definitely um, swarms. Is oftentimes the thing, and, and we have one anecdotally from a homeless guy that was camping out in a camper near one of the big stock car yards in California the first year. This homeless guy said one day <clears throat> that he was walking down the road and he found rubies and dead dying bees along the borrow pits and so on, and he had seen multiple swarms coming out of the out of the yards and so on. So that was probably the exodus. Yes, sir. Okay, the genetically so far the studies I've seen, and again we haven't looked at the study that I see, indicate that genetically modified plants are a threat to bees, although the nutritional value of the pollen and so on may be compromised because they're not selecting for that in the attributes that they're looking for. Uh, again, kind of like the pesticides, I see no when you look at hundreds and thousands of these things, you, you know, it's like cell phones. You know, I, but the pesticides, GMO, and so on, it's like cell phones. Well, I might believe cell phones if the only cases of CCD were in urban areas where there were lots of cell towers. But I'll tell you, in Montana and Wyoming and Idaho and California, there's a lot of places where this thing hanging on my belt won't pick up a cell phone signal at all. And that's where I've seen some of the worst, most massive kills. So 
that's partly why I personally don't think pesticides are the main driving thing here. They may be a contributing factor. Yes? Um, high fructose corn syrup has been implicated as an increase in uh, Nosema, but I haven't seen any science. Okay, high fructose corn syrup uh, in our original surveys uh, did not show a correlation with it, but high fructose syrup, syrup some of the guys said they had CCD, we did some analysis and found that the biggest thing was is that some of these guys were going out, leaving it in their tanks, then it was cold and it didn't pump well, so they were putting heaters in there. And you got a metal tank and you put a heater in it, and guess what? You got the uh, formula for catalyzing the reaction and producing uh, the uh, uh, hydroxymethyl furfural that's toxic to bees. So, you know, if you don't handle your high fructose corn syrup properly, you can kill your own bees. And at least one big Texas operation was doing that and so on, and calling the CCD. Now, Personally, and I'll tell you, when we train bees and so on, bees don't like high fructose as well as they like sucrose and so on, and I generally think that sucrose is a better overall diet. So from the general nutritional standpoint, uh, I don't think high fructose is as good. Yes? You mentioned that you thought that every three or four years, maybe worse years? That's what the beekeepers, the big boys, tell me. Oh, it's just yeah, but I heard enough of them. You know, they basically think 2006 wasn't the first time around of this thing, and they basically say about three or four, and that would make sense from the scenario I just described. They collapsed, the collapse operation is pretty well purged it out or pushed it down to a low level. The next year they come back, and you get a good nutrition year, you be rally, they look really, really good, and so on. A couple years later, things turn south, you get a little bit of nutritional stress, you get a little bit of weather stress on them, and so on. Boom, down they go again. Yes? You said you're group isn't getting most of the funding. Who's getting most of the funding and who's in charge of where the funding goes? Well, the biggest pots of money for this are obviously out of the USDA. And the USDA CRIS program essentially elected early on to put out not lots of small awards, but to bundle them as big packages. So $4 million went to the CAPS program. And there's lots of good research being done on that. So we, we put in this proposal they basically rejected our proposal saying that my team would never discover anything. So, um, but anyway, um, and, and I'm not, you know, you know, there are good scientists doing good things, but they got that. Another four million went for the wide area thing to the uh, labs. Next year, they were hard pressed to find any money. There was no external funds on it. So on last year, there was a call, but uh, every one of the things that we proposed has been rejected. So um, uh, until we get some money from somewhere, we're kind of stalled. Yes? Well, what we've seen is that in, not all the time, but in many cases when you have CCD and you have the collapse, you'll see wax moths, uh, high butyl, everything abandoned, won't, they'll be gone. And originally I was looking to see if there was a chemical behind that, and there still, still may be, but I can't find it. Uh, uh, the main thing I saw change chemical-wise is a lot more of the things uh, from mite control and so on. But uh, uh, what the beekeepers tell me, what we experience, if your colony if you see the pests start to move back in on that equipment, it's probably safe to use. One possibility is that it may actually kill them. Um, if this iridescent is a broad-based insect. It's not beyond the realm of possibility that this virus is knocking out the pests. Thank you. You're going to cut me off.